So that concludes that series of slides that demonstrate all the different types of uh, texts that coalesce into Orientalist discourse and all the different ways uh, in which Orientalism works and the various forms in which Orientalist discourse uh, manifests itself in the viewing and treatment of people in the East. So there's definitely a huge power disparity between the East and the West in terms of the West discursive ability to unilaterally represent both themselves and the East, and the East's relative lack of ability to reciprocate or represent themselves or speak for themselves. And this discursive power inequality is based on and facilitated by the fact that at the time during the 17th and 18th century, it was very much a one-way street in terms of people in the West having a lot more funds and resources to travel to and visit the East and see the East and then return to the West and represent the East to fellow Westerners. That's not a two-way street. There weren't nearly as many, if any, Easterners traveling to the West to see the West and then return to the East and share tall tales about what they experienced in the West to their fellow Easterners. It was very much a unilateral direction of representation as opposed to a bilateral mutual representation. So Western scientists and scholars and missionaries and soldiers and traders all had the ability to travel eastward and then return to the West to recount or partially fabricate or largely fabricate their experience of these faraway lands without the inhabitants of those faraway lands being able to uh, resist or represent themselves or have any say in the matter. And the Westerners would return from their eastward travels and tell their friends, like I said, very tall tales about what they experienced there to again perpetuate all of those negative aspects that are proliferated by Orientalist discourse, the exoticness, the eroticness, the backwardness, the antiquated and mystical nature of the East. Likely partially to impress their friends and family back home, like, oh, look at what I saw and experienced when I was traveling East. But it does have the resultant corollary effect of producing a biased and inaccurate skewed perception of what life and being and the people of a certain land really is and was like. So in the back of this slide we have a still image from the animated Disney movie Aladdin which was also in the introductory slide and that Disney movie is very much an orientalist text. It's a more contemporary media text but it's based on the original story in 1001 Nights the story of Aladdin and the magic lamp, and it paints the Middle East as this exotic, mystical place where everyone's flying around on magic carpets. They all got pet monkeys and a genie sidekick that comes out of a magic lamp. It's a way of fictionalizing the very real existence of human beings and making it seem unreal, putting distance between you and your subjective experience and the experience of others. It serves to otherize them, to dehumanize them, to make it seem as if their lives are unreal, as if they're fiction, which then makes the whole process of colonization and subjugating an entire population of people seem more justified, more tolerable, more easy to swallow. If you don't think of them as real people with experiences similar to yours and relatable to yours, it makes it easier to be okay with exploiting them and subjecting them to inhuman conditions if you don't even see them as humans to begin with. So Orientalist discourse works to put a lot of distance between your experience as a Westerner and the discursively constructed, completely unrelatable, mystical experiences of those in the East. Severing any empathy between people in the West uh, would have for people in the East without even seeing them firsthand. Because from what they can see in discourse, there doesn't seem to be a commonly shared experience within which each side can recognize the other as a human, as opposed to just, you know, this faceless, mysterious entity. You can't practically see any of yourself in the image of the other when they're represented in such a caricature-like way. And that's what empathy is. It's putting yourself in the position of others. But in this case, when it's been so... When the position of others has been so dramatically skewed and misrepresented, then it's not conducive to facilitating any feelings of empathy or mutual humanity 
between these discursively constructed binary opposites of the Occident and the Orient, so that people in the West could be ex sorry, people in the East could be exploited. They could be living in terrible conditions as a result of the West, and people in the West wouldn't care because in Westerners' heads they're thinking, okay, those guys are all flying on their magic carpets and rubbing their magic lamps anyways. So Orientalist depictions may seem very fun and alluring and playful and fantastical like this image uh, in the background of the slide, but representations like these are put into service of a more insidi insidious and ideological dehumanizing effect where we just become unrelatable to each other. It, it otherizes the East and discursively constructs them as the other and turns them into that other end of the opposing binary between one other East-West, uh, Orient-Occident, subject-object, mind-body, male-female, culture-nature. The East is put on the losing end of that binary along with the body, along with female, along with object along with other, the, the East and the Orient are just placed right along that binary logic. So that through Orientalist discourse, the Easterner becomes an object to be studied and a mystery to be solved through Western knowledge production and consequently the exploitative and domineering practices of imperialism and colonialism, rather than just viewing them as fellow humans. So I see a lot of shades of de Beauvoir in this idea in the sense that the West is putting the East into the position of being incapable of looking after themselves. And the West points to that position that they just put them into and says, see, they're incapable of taking care of themselves. We need to take care of them. And we need to deploy all of these scholars and writers and artists and traders and administrators to take care of and watch over and study and learn more about uh, to understand the East, but their specific Western understanding of the East and thus the representations of the region and its inhabitants and relations between the two regions were skewed in a way to naturalize this binary between Europe as the one and places like Asia and Africa as the other. Again, it's all being done under the guise of it being in the benefit of the East. The West puts the East in a position where they can't speak for themselves. And then the West takes it upon themselves to speak for the East and to represent the East on the West's behalf because they're allegedly unable to represent themselves. And then it becomes that self-fulfilling prophecy where people in the East come to believe those representations of themselves, the ideas that the West makes of them, because that's the only meaningful subject position that's made open within this global discourse. For them to meaningfully occupy and it's a subject position that they didn't make for themselves it was carved out for them by the west with a lot of power motives in mind to disempower the eastern subject it's a very disempowering subject position to occupy with meaning and discourse like i said in the week on gender identity it's more of an object position than a subject position so this quote by sayyid kind of speaks to that point where he says my analysis of the Orientalist text therefore places emphasis on the evidence for such representations as representations, not as natural depictions of the Orient. The, this evidence is found just as prominently in the so-called truthful texts, history, philological analysis, political treatises, as in the avowedly artistic, i.e. openly imaginative fictional texts. The exteriority, that is the, the surface level of the representation, is always governed by some version of the truism that if the Orient couldn't rep could represent itself, it would. But since it cannot, the representation by the West does the job for the West and folk de mieux, all the better for the poor Orient. So every discourse has its own built-in justification for the existence of that discourse. And Orientalism's justification is that the East doesn't have the resources or the capabilities to represent themselves. So the West does it, and it's allegedly for the benefit of the East. And this justification is produced by the ideological process at work behind this discourse. The idea that the East can't speak for itself, therefore the West needs to speak for them. Even though the West is the one who puts the gag over the East's mouth, discursively covering their ability to give meaning to their own experiences instead of having it done for them by Westerners.
Have you ever felt that sense of frustration when someone puts words in your mouth or misrepresents you or just the feeling of powerlessness you may have by being misrepresented in that way? That's how powerless people in the Orient feel with this whole discourse about them and they don't even have a say in the matter. They don't have any input in shaping this discourse that's entirely constructed to represent them and give meaning to them. And then this idea, the subject position of the inferior Easterner, the exotic and backwards and mystical individual, then becomes the only meaningful subject position that an Easterner can step into if they want to possess meaning within that discourse. So if an Easterner wants to show up to the West as a meaningful subject who possesses meaning from the lens that the Westerner is wearing, they need to step into one of the stereotyped subject positions made available within that lens. Take a Chinese actor in the 70s or 80s or 90s, for example, going to Hollywood and think of the various roles that they would have to play to uh, be cast for a Hollywood uh, movie and the roles that they, they're given to represent their Chinese culture. A lot of them were very stereotypical portrayals, uh, demeaning and derogatory. But in order for that actor or actress to find success in the culture industry of Hollywood, they need to step into that role and perpetuate these stereotypes because that's the only role that's carved out for them within this discourse, that negative, stereotypical portrayal of Chinese culture or Eastern culture at large. And if that actor or actress decides to have too much integrity to take the role and they don't take it, then there's a thousand other actors uh, in the culture industry who will gladly, willingly, and eagerly take that role, even if it, we said, it just perpetuates the negative representations of their culture. So the West makes the chessboard, and in order to play, you have to play by their rules. The same thing we were saying with women and feminists trying to open up more representation within male-dominated discourse, it would be the same with the East trying to open up representation within a discourse that's already foundationally shaped by the West. So we need to make and proliferate new chessboards, new discourses that open up new subject positions that more accurately and positively reflect and represent the Eastern ways of life and ways of being. So I mentioned earlier that Aladdin, the Disney appropriation of the original written story, was based on a story from 1001 Nights, which was a collection of Middle Eastern folk tales compiled in the Arabic language during the Islamic Golden Age, about 8th century to 14th century. But when it was translated into French for consumption in the West by the French translator Antoine Gaillon, you can see his picture in the top right corner of the slide, he took a lot of his own artistic liberties and added new stories that weren't a part of the original Arabic version and which served to very much orientalize Eastern culture in the minds of European readers when they do read these stories. So the stories in this book, 1001 Nights, are supposed to be the quintessential defining stories of Arabic Middle Eastern culture. And originally, in its original Arabic language form, it was this book of all those culturally significant folk tales. But when Gayand was in the process of translating it, he added many of his own stories, like complete fabrications that weren't included in, in the original Arabic version of 1001 Nights. And these stories include Aladdin's Wonderful Lamp, which is what the Disney movie was based on centuries later. You can see a picture of that in uh, the bottom left corner. And another story that Gayan made up was Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves, and that picture is in the top left corner. And also the Seven Voyages of Sinbad the Sailor in the bottom right corner. So all of these stories that Gayan fabricated in the process of translation of the Arabic text into French, French uh, paint the Orient as being very antiquated and exotic and mystical. All the things you've been talking about in this lecture so far. And unfortunately, these stories have become the most recognized and definitive canonical texts to represent the region and depict the Middle East uh, in Westerners' eyes at the time. And for a long time afterwards, even to present day with things like Disney movies based on these old uh, folklore stories. And these stories, uh, like I said, they seep, they trickle down 
to influence our latent and uh, subconscious biases and conceptions of the East. At the time, people had to believe Guyon's distorted representations of the East through these fabricated stories because they couldn't visit the East to see for themselves. But even as more and more Westerners traveled to the East as technological developments such as faster ships and airplanes allowed for that, more and more Westerners could visit the East and see and judge for themselves that these stories were full of myth and inaccuracies. But there's still this subconscious thing where if there's so many stories that point towards the same skewed perception of a culture, even though you know it consciously to be untrue, subconsciously it can very much reinforce certain biases, certain dehumanizing and otherizing biases that we have towards people from the Middle East. So for example, from the Alibaba story, uh, as seen in the top left image, comes that I iconic image of the Sultan, uh, the, the greedy thief, wearing the turban, having that big saber in his hand. That image of the Sultan with the turban and the beard and the saber is burned into the psyche of Westerners and many Easterners as well. We kind of absorb it through osmosis just by simply existing in our culture. We receive this proliferation of skewed images of the East and it's kind of implanted in our subconscious. And then a lot of modern stories and media texts are based on and layered upon these very old historical stories and folklore. And if those stories were translated by someone like Antoine Gaillard with their own ulterior motives, they're going to be very inaccurate and skewed misrepresentations of what was really happening and what is really happening in the minds and lives of people in the East. So here we have a painting by Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres. I believe he was a French painter. And this is a painting he did near the beginning of the 1800s of a concubine in the East, of a prostitute. So it's supposed to represent an Oriental woman, an Eastern woman. And take a look at the painting. Does anything strike you as odd about it? Take a look at this picture of the woman. Do you think it's completely anatomically correct? There are some very subtle distortions going on even in the representation of the feminine oriental subject. So the spine of this woman is almost inhumanly serpentine, like very snake-like. It's not anatomically correct. I'm pretty sure this person, if they existed in real life, wouldn't be able to stand upright or walk properly because they have like seven too many vertebrae in their spine. And their head seems very small in comparison with the rest of their body. The focus of the painting, the focal point that the viewer's eye is being drawn to is mostly fixated on her body. She's completely unclothed. You can see her clothing just to the left of her on the bed. She's even barefoot. It seems as if she's just undressed and she's gotten into the bed and she's looking behind herself at the viewer, kind of alluring them to come join her. Even though she's her her face is towards the viewer, the rest of her body is facing away from the perspective of the painter and the viewer. It enhances that idea of the East as a mystery to be discovered and solved by the Western subject. And just consider the other values, the implicit values and ideological implications of this kind of portrayal of the Eastern woman. It portrays them as very much a sex object, the kind of person who just lazes about all day, as part of a harem of women just sitting on the bed waiting for the Westerner to come home after a hard day of exploration and adventure and offer the Westerner an opportunity to indulge in a bit more exploration and adventure, this time in terms of the uncharted territory of her mysterious, otherwise, otherized Eastern body. Like I said last week, the body is equated to nature and the mind is equated to culture. And women, especially orientalized women, are again reduced to being just a body. They're doubly in shadow by virtue of their gender and their skin color. And then moving a bit upwards, the, a small head uh, might evoke the idea that Easterners aren't meant for thinking. They're kind of just meant uh, to be used for their bodies and for extracting labor or sexual gratification or deriving other use values and exchange values from their bodies. As if Easterners are painted as not being so much thinking people and 
once more, the West overlaps with the positive sides of the binaries of culture and the mind, while the East is reduced in discourse to a harvestable and manipulable nature and bodies. And this painting seems to draw a lot of parallels towards the East in general, how the East is seen as just a body that's opened itself up for the Westerner to explore and dominate. So these kinds of discursive texts uh, sexualize the Eastern subject. It, it dehumanizes them and renders them an object to be put on display and viewed and studied and encroached upon and penetrated, just like the territory she inhabits. It's reducing uh, feminine East Eastern subjects to this mysterious, denuded, serpentine sex object looking invitingly at the viewer, lying on a bed all day, waiting for the Western man to come home and uh, take advantage of what's rightfully his. And this woman is a metaphor for the East in general, as just this thing that lies about and isn't productive with their territory, and therefore they require the West to come in and make them productive and take what rightfully belongs to the West. So that's an example of an early 19th century painting as an Orientalist text. But what about something more contemporary? What about a television show that I used to watch as a kid? It was, it was and still is very much considered uh, entertainment slash educational material for children. Before it was ever an animated TV show that a lot of us know today, the story of Babar the Elephant started as a book written in 1931 by a French writer, Jean de Brunhoff which he said was fashioned from a bedtime story that his wife used to tell his children when they were young. So it started uh, with its publishing in 1931, and then as an illustrated book series, it had steady popularity for some decades, and then became an animated television series starting in the late 1980s. And I believe the franchise still exists in various mediated forms. When I googled pictures, for Babar the Elephant, there seems to be a new CGI version for like a new generation of kids. But this is the one I grew up with, the animated TV show about an elephant named Babar who grew up as a, rel a regular elephant amongst his herd somewhere in Northern Africa. And all of them were walking on four legs and completely naked, of course, as elephants are in nature. But then Babar's parents died or were killed and he was left an orphan. Then he was saved and adopted by a kindly French woman who was a wealthy aristocrat. She takes Babar away from his roots as this animal belonging to nature. And she teaches him how to be civilized and cultured. And under the French woman's tutelage, Babar learns to speak very eloquently and wears proper clothes like a human. He drives cars and uses human technology. He even learns to walk on two legs as opposed to four legs. It's very much a rags to riches success story where Babar starts as just an animal in Africa and is lucky enough to be extracted from his homeland and taken to France and then is taught how to be civilized and ends up becoming the king of all elephants. He returns to Africa to rule his kind as their leader. So there are some very dark colonial implications to the cheery bright uh, surface image of the story. It reflects not only the capturing of slaves in Africa to be extracted from the periphery in service of the core, but even more closely it reflects and it anticipates more recent patterns of African political leaders who at a young age joined the British army in the military administration of their own homeland. So even post-colonially, British military had a, a presence in a lot of these African countries, and a lot of young African men joined uh, the, the British military, not their home military. They joined the, military, uh, the British army and got British education, and through that, they were taught and indoctrinated in European ideological value systems. And then a lot of them were planted back into their home country's political system to become national leaders and rule in Britain and other colonial uh, best interests to the detriment and the well-being of the country that they're ruling. the Afri Their homeland that they came from originally, they are now ruling that homeland in the best interests of where they learned uh, in Britain. And this led to some of the most corrupt 
uh, political leaders in Africa and uh, major human rights abuses and uh, widespread mismanagement of the, the regions in Africa and their inhabitants. So I never considered any of this when I was a kid watching this TV show and learning this story about Babar. It was a delightful show. And I liked Babar as a character, but there are a lot of very troubling and disconcerting implications of this whole story and its underlying values and how it serves as an implicit justification for colonial and post-colonial practices and implicitly justifies the French colonizing the North Horn of Africa, allegedly for Africa's betterment for the sake of the improvement of the lies of lives of those in Africa like would you rather be a naked elephant walking on all fours this savage animalistic uncivilized barbaric untamed beast or would you rather become part of civilized society and be a part of social progress and high culture that's what France is allegedly offering people in Africa by colonizing them, by taking away their independence, as if they need to bow down to France in order to rid themselves of their primitive nature, their wild nature, and become more domesticated and respectable people. So we had an example of an old painting, then an example of a contemporary kids book and show, but what about news media? What about tabloids? What about media coverage and representation that aren't fictional, they aren't artistic, they claim to be reporting the news and current events and merely reflecting the reality of whatever situation they're reporting on. So we can analyze news items as uh, Orientalist texts surrounding the figure of Meghan Markle in this case and the tabloid's treatment of her, the words surrounding her and the signified meanings associated with the signifier of a young black woman in British news outlets. So in this slide, we have the same UK news outlet, the Daily Mail, covering the exact same topic, but just two different people who are experiencing it. On the left, we have Kate Middleton, and the headline for that one reads, Not long to go, pregnant Kate tenderly cradles her baby bump while wrapping up her royal duties ahead of maternity leave. And William confirms she's due any minute now. That's how the Daily Mail reported on Kate Middleton touching her baby bump while pregnant. And then on the right, we have another story covering the exact same topic. Meghan Markle is touching her baby bump when she was pregnant in just the same way that Middleton did. But look at the difference when the headline is about Markle. Why can't Meghan Markle keep her hands off her bump? Experts tackle the question that has got the nation talking. Is it pride, vanity, acting, or a new age bonding technique? So obviously I added my own dramatic emphasis a little bit, but still these are two very different tones used for talking about the exact same thing. Just a woman touching her pregnant belly. And in one case on the left, it's all these positive undertones and very nice and innocent. And then the one on the right is more like an interrogation. It's like what I was talking about, how the East is discursively constructed to appear as this deceptive mystery that needs to be unraveled by the experts from the West. Like the, the headline literally mentioned, experts tackle. The headline questions if Meghan Markle is too prideful or vain, which are both negative qualities, or if she's acting and thus deceiving us. Or is it a new new age bonding technique trying to imply that Markle is this exotic, hippy-dippy, uh, scheming and tricky and inscrutable individual who needs to be analyzed and scrutinized and speculated upon in order to be solved and figured out by the West. The UK media is treating Meghan Markle as if she's an object of study, as if she was an object that was discovered in Africa and brought back to the homeland of Britain to be studied under a microscope for its inscrutable meanings. And look at the different sections of the Daily Mail that these stories covering the exact same topic are put into. So the Kate Middleton story is categorized under the female section, which I'm guessing is more about like lighthearted, feel-good, special interest news stories related to women, maybe like celebrity gossip kind of stuff. And it's written by humans, 
with actual identifiable names, Sophia Brennan and Rebecca English. And then the story on the right belongs to the cold hard news category. And it's reported on by an anonymous source. And there's none of that humanizing lightheartedness that the left column possesses. It's treated much more seriously, as if there's something serious and seriously wrong with whatever Markle is doing to the point where it would be classified uh, as strictly news. And you may be thinking, oh, that's just one example. I'm sure that's just an exception to the rule. It's just an anomaly. Well, here's another example. Again, both from the same news outlet covering the exact same topic from two completely different angles based on the skin color of the subject of that topic. So on the left, the headline reads, Young Manchester City footballer, 20, on 25,000 quid a week, splashes out on mansion on market for 2.25 million pounds, despite having never started a Premier League match. But then when it's a white guy who does the same thing, the headline reads, Manchester City starlet Phil Foden buys new $2 million home for his mum. So notice the difference in the news, uh, news's treatment of these two people and the, the verbiage, the language used in each headline. First of all, at least for the white guy, they, they name him. They give him a name, thus humanizing him and identifying him. And look at the word mum. Like that's such a humanizing word there. Oh, he's just buying it for his mum. And they call him the endearing term starlet, like a young star. Whereas the guy on the left, he's not called a starlet. He's just called a footballer. Like that's such a more cold term. And it doesn't name him. It doesn't give him that benefit of humanizing him with a name. And the headline, it really emphasizes just how young he is and how he never started a Premier League match. And the, the term splashing out, like it's kind of subtly implying that he's he's reckless with his money and i'm sure uh phil foden he didn't spend exactly two million i'm sure it's a bit over two million but they just say two million that's good enough but for the one on the left no it's 2.25 million you got to put the extra 0.25 in there and, and one of them is called a mansion you know this extravagant luxurious thing and then the other one is just a home and even the pictures that they choose to uh to match the headline it's as if the two respective players are reacting to the headline. Like the, the one on the left, like dumbstruck, just mouth agape and staring sullenly. And the other one is a bit more upbeat. You know, he's pointing, he's in action. So it's hard, harder to say that the first one on the previous slide is a coincidence when here's another example from the exact same outlet. And in both cases, uh, with this one and the Middleton Marco one, the, the two stories come out like within less than a year of each other. So you also can't use the excuse that, oh, just uh, time passed and things are looked at differently. So it's not just paintings. It's not just uh, TV shows. Uh, Orientalist discourse operates within even news outlets, which just shows the variety with which Orientalism can take any mediated form, including video games, such as the classic Prince of Persia video game. You may be more familiar with the modernized version uh, of this video game franchise that you see on the right of the slide, but the original, uh, whose cover you see on the left, is so orientalized. From the architecture of those, those uh, stereotypical orientalized buildings, to the figure of the villain, the antagonist in, the, in this game, who's got all the stereotypical features of a Middle Eastern villain. Like, he uses magic to deceive people and get his way and he has one of those evil classic evil mustaches and beards and he steals the princess from the brave prince and then again that image of the sultan with the saber sword and the turban is so burned into the, our collective psyches that it even manifests itself and emerges on a video game cover 